Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Lauren Izzo. Coming up in this edition. For the first time since Biden moved into the White House, the U.S. Secretary of Defense lands in Israel and Iran is on the agenda. Israel says goodbye to the Duke of Edinburgh and remembers the legacy he and his family left with the Jewish people. And after a devastating oil spill on Israel's shores, these little turtles are finally heading home. Reactions poured in from all over the world on the weekend after Kensington Palace confirmed the death of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, just six weeks shy of his 100th birthday. Philip was the longest serving royal consort in British history and was married to Queen Elizabeth for 73 years. Israeli officials among world leaders expressing their condolences. President Reuven Rivlin sent heartfelt condolences on Twitter. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called the prince a consummate public servant who will be missed in Israel and across the world. Chairman of the Jewish agency Isaac Herzog also posted his reaction, sending condolences to the royal family, the British people and the UK's Jewish community. Herzog adding that the Duke of Edinburgh was part of a generation who fought the Nazis in World War II and his mother was a righteous among the nations. Sarah Miller is a British-Israeli journalist and also the managing editor of Ynet English. She filed this report about what Prince Philip's legacy means to her. The Queen has been on the throne for 70 years almost. Um, throughout the whole time, Prince Philip has been by her side or technically two steps behind her. He was, for nearly every British person alive, as much a part of the British establishment and the British culture as fish and chips or a pint in the pub. And in fact, my one of my earliest uh, memories is of being a very small child and being lined up with my classmates outside school to wave a little Union Jack as Prince Philip drove past in a very big car. So for me and for nearly everybody, Prince Philip has always been there. And I think to a certain extent, people imagine that he always would. And it's been very interesting to see the British response to this. People seem to be genuinely upset. I personally always liked Philip. He worked hard. He never complained. He had a habit of saying what he thought, whether it was appropriate or not. And people like that. People like the feeling that he was a genuine person and what you saw was what you got. Prince Philip's legacy is particularly important right here in Israel. In 1993, his mother, Princess Alice, was named by Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nations after she provided shelter for Jewish victims of the Holocaust during the Second World War. She is buried on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. In 1994, Philip made a historic personal visit to Israel to honor his mother, the first visit to the state of Israel by a British royal since the end of the British Mandate. Let's find out more from Dr. Joel Zissenwein, Director of the Righteous Among the Nations Department at Yad Vashem. Thank you for joining us, Joel. Thank you. So first of all, how does one um, actually come to receive the title of Righteous Among the Nations? What is the exact criteria and from which backgrounds do most of these people in this category um, fall into? Well, there are some basic uh, criteria that uh, are applied by the uh, by a public commission for the designation of the righteous among the nations. Um, there's an issue of personal risk. Uh, there's also the issue of the of the uh, act of rescue being done for no reason beyond will to rescue Jews. So, in other words, if there was money involved, that usually uh, disqualifies the uh, rescuer from receiving the title. There are also issues of types of uh, sources, the historical sources that are available. Well, Prince Philip, um, like I said, had a rather special connection to Israel and the Jewish people, of course, because of his mother. Can you explain how Princess Alice found herself in a position to be able to um, help and give shelter to Jewish Holocaust victims? Um, well, the um, Princess Alice um, assisted um, the Cohen family from uh, northern Greece during uh, between 1943 and 1944. 
Um, apparently, the Cohen family, uh, head of the family, Heinke, Heinke Cohen, was a member of parliament and had maintained uh, a relationship with the Greek, with the Greek royal family from uh, throughout the 1920s and 1930s when they fled to Athens, which was not under German occupation till, not, till the fall of 1943, they apparently established some kind of contact. Later on, after the head of the family, uh, Heinke Cohen, passed away, the, his widow managed to um, establish some kind of contact with uh, Princess Alice, and she was offered uh, shelter in the princess's uh, official residence. Well, after um, Alice was given the, that title of Righteous Among the Nations, Prince Philip visited Israel in 1994 to attend a Yad Vashem ceremony to honor his mother. What was unique about this visit, and what was Philip's reaction about being able to be part of it? Um, Prince, Prince Philip, uh, I believe, was one of the first members of the royal family to actually make a visit to uh, Israel during that period. Um, he gave a very moving speech at the uh, ceremony in which he talked about some of his personal memories of... Uh, during the 1930s of coming in contact with uh, a Jewish uh, youth who was under, uh, it, this was while he was still residing in Germany, who was under her, being harassed by some of his classmates. Um, he also talked about his uh, warm memory of the, uh, the importance of his mother's actions as well. And of course, he also um, planted a tree in the uh, Avenue of the Righteous Among the Nations, honoring his mother. All right, very interesting. Dr. Zissenwein, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, after Israel marked Holocaust Remembrance Day last week, the country is now marking another World War II milestone. Sixty years ago on this day, the trial of Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann began. After being captured by a long Mossad manhunt in Argentina, he was smuggled to Israel on a commercial flight where he would be tried for his crimes against humanity. Eichmann was the architect of the Nazis' final solution, under which six million European Jews were exterminated during World War II. He was found guilty by the court and sentenced to death by hanging in 1962. All right, let's fast forward now. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin arrived in Israel this morning, a first visit by a senior representative of the Biden administration. Austin was welcomed at Ben Gurion Airport by IDF Chief of Staff Aviv Kochavi and later arrived at the Defense Ministry headquarters where he was welcomed by Defense Minister Benny Gantz. Austin is also due to meet with Netanyahu during the two-day visit, which officials said would include discussions of U.S. arms supplies to Israel, but the main topic on the agenda is Iran. And we will work closely with our American allies to ensure that any new agreement with Iran will secure the vital interest of the world, of the United States, prevent dangerous arms race in our region, and protect the state of Israel. As a major strategic partner for the United States, our bilateral relationship with Israel in particular is central to regional stability and security in the Middle East. All right, let's see what we have to look forward to from Dr. Fadi Esmail, a research fellow at the International Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC Herzliya. Thank you, sir, for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. So although nothing concrete as of yet, it seems like Biden is looking to reintroduce diplomacy into U.S.-Iran ties and maybe re-enter the nuclear deal. Does Israel have any real influence on the U.S. in this regard? Can Gantz or Netanyahu possibly say anything uh, to change the mind of the Secretary of Defense during this visit? Of course. I mean, I don't know if to change the mind of the Secretary of Defense. In the end, it's uh, the President Biden's decision. <clears throat> but, uh, <clears throat> sorry, but uh, of course, the, the two nations have a wide array of, uh, of shared interests and uh, many, many areas in which they collaborate and can influence each other. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that at this point it's going to be a question of whether or not to engage in a softer diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but rather in uh, the details of it. Uh, President Biden has taken uh, an approach that is uh, different than that is of his predecessor, uh, uh, Mr. Trump. And uh, uh, it, this new approach brings with it uh, many challenges that uh, have to do with the many areas in which the Iranians are involved, uh, many areas in terms of uh, physical geographical areas, as well as 
uh, areas of, um, of uh, uh, activity, not only the nuclear deal. The nuclear deal is basically like a, uh, the lightning rod that everything um, attracts to, but in fact, there's so many other issues that have to do with Iran's outreach all over the Middle East and even beyond the borders of the Middle East. Uh, that have to do with uh, modern military technologies that the Iranians are developing and, and stockpiling and uh, the issues of terrorism and so on. So um, you have also, we have also to remember that there are other allies or countries of interest <clears throat> in the Middle East that are important to the U.S. Uh, there is a, a very sensitive situation in Iraq uh, with the, the last week some uh, interesting exchanges between the government of Iraq had led by uh, Prime Minister Qasemi and the Iranian regime. Uh, there are issues that have to do with uh, Saudi Arabia and its war in Yemen. There, there are other issues um, that have to do with Syria, Lebanon, and so on. So Israel is not the only issue. And I believe that the Iranians will play uh, this game very, very, very masterfully. Uh, during the days of uh, uh, President uh, Trump, he, he kind of made it simple in a way. He just decided to lay the law, throw the book at the Iranians, and basically put a maximum pressure as much as possible on the Iranian regime. Anything short of that gives the Iranians, being very good merchants, gives them a very wide field of experimentation and maneuvering. And it will be very interesting to see how the current administration will, will operate vis-a-vis -vis such very, very masterful uh, uh, negotiators. Uh, we don't know everything that's taking place. Um, I, I want to believe that uh, uh, now the Israeli government is able to uh, at least get some compensation in all kinds of ways uh, if uh, from the U.S. government in case that indeed the Biden administration mm -hmm. uh, decide to uh, give Iran access to tens of billions of dollars, maybe even hundreds of billions, of dollars, it could be two or three hundred billion dollars, which will change the picture of the Middle East. And if anybody wants to know how that looks like, just think four or five years back and you will understand what it means. So um, I, I think, yes, of course, there are many leverages that uh, uh, Israeli leaders can uh, act, can use, uh, many shared interests, and a lot of uh, space for give and take. And in the end, we have to remember the very special relationship between these two countries. Uh, that runs very deep uh, to the level of the of, of the people. Right. I mean, it's a very very deep. So I'm sure of a hope that some reasonable uh, arrangements will will be uh, reached to. Interesting. We'll have to wait and see how this special relationship evolves. Dr. Ismail, thank you so much for joining me. For having me. Good evening. An Egged bus was heavily damaged over the weekend after being attacked with stones and firebombs in an East Jerusalem neighborhood. Police saying in a statement, the driver took a shortcut on his route and mistakenly entered the Isawiya neighborhood, where his bus was attacked by local residents. There were no passengers on the bus except for the driver himself and his family, who were in the vehicle with him at the time. They fled the scene on foot and reported the incident to police forces nearby. The fire on the bus was extinguished before police forces arrived at the scene. <laughs> Member of Knesset Ofer Kassif was brutally assaulted by police in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of East Jerusalem over the weekend while he attended a protest. He alleged that police officers knew he was a Knesset member and didn't care. Israel Police's Jerusalem district said an investigation would be opened into the incident in a statement saying body cameras and additional documentation will prove what actually happened during the demonstration and new facts should surface in the coming hours. Moving on now, the process and qualifications for making Aliyah can vary depending on where you come from. For example, Russian nationals' status may differ based on whether they're seeking to relocate from the U.S. or from Russia. 
Now here to give us some legal advice on what to expect is Irena Rosenberg from Cohen, Decker, Pex and Broch Law Offices who specializes in immigration. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. So from which countries do you get uh, most of these inquiries, in inquiries, excuse me, and who is eligible to apply? Uh, we get the inquiries from all over the world, but uh, most of the inquiries uh, uh, are from uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine and the United States. Interesting. Um, and how does that process differ between um, the US, Russia and Europe? So uh, first of all, I have uh, to uh, notice that uh, uh, Jews as well as their children and grandchildren are eligible to uh, get Israeli citizenship based on the law of return. So uh, the processes uh, are different for uh, Jews and their children and grandchildren uh, if uh, the person has a, a Russian citizenship or US citizenship. If the person has a, a US citizenship, he has to provide the Jewish agency, uh, which uh, is uh, reviewed uh, the eligibility of uh, this person. He has to provide uh, the Jewish agency with the letter from the recognized rabbi stating that this person uh, is uh, Jewish or that this person has Jewish roots. Uh, so if uh, we are speaking about uh, Russian citizens, in this case, the person has uh, to turn to the consular department native and to provide uh, the official documents with the nationality stating that uh, this person has uh, uh, Jewish uh, ancestors. And what happens if the applicant um, was born in Russia but has American citizenship? Uh, in this case, the person has uh, to provide uh, the consular department native with uh, uh, the document stating that uh, he has uh, Jewish ancestors and it has to be uh, official original documents. And uh, for many Americans, it's a real shock because uh, many of them, they moved to the United States in very, very early age and many of them, they even don't speak uh, Russian. So in such cases, we help to these people to get, uh, to restore the documents from Russia in order to get Aliyah. So you obviously deal with a lot of uh, unique cases. Can you perhaps give us an example of a particularly complicated case that you overcame and found solutions for? We have uh, a lot of uh, cases where we have to restore the documents from for uh, American citizens uh, who uh, are originally uh, Russian. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, most of the cases, 99 and 9 uh, uh, percent, uh, we successfully uh, restore the documents and uh, we successfully uh, win uh, the cases and uh, help to our clients. Great, Irena Rosenberg, thank you very much for joining me today. My pleasure, thank you. Well, after a devastating oil spill contaminated the Mediterranean, killing marine life, the sea is recovering and some of its residents are finally getting to return home. This one's for the turtles. Take a look. A handful of endangered sea turtles have been returned to Israel's Mediterranean waters after surviving an oil spill that required they undergo weeks of cleaning, including gastric purges with mayonnaise. <laughs> The mid-February disaster, blamed by Israeli authorities on crude released from a passing ship, blighted coasts as far north as Lebanon and Gaza to the south. Wildlife casualties included 29 green or loggerhead turtles that washed up dead. I think this is a kind of alarm for all of us. Uh, if we were going uh, to bring more and more ships and more and more naval tools, uh, vessels to our ports, uh, the risk of another uh, spill like that, contamination, is enormous. And I think the, uh, if we're not going to take care of the security of those ships, we're going to suffer a lot. But three of each endangered breed were rescued by the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, whose rangers used cotton buds and wipes to painstakingly dislodge tar from the plate-sized animals' eyes, noses, and mouths. Tube-fed mayonnaise also served to expel oil that had been swallowed or inhaled by the snappers, the authority said. 
The turtles, whose sex was not yet clear given their young age, were lowered off a boat into the Mediterranean, some five kilometers from shore, a distance the rangers hoped would spare them danger from predators, fishermen, or marine traffic. Hannah Rifkin, ILTV. And finally, new research from Israel claims to show that during prehistoric times, people liked to get high. According to a team of Israeli scholars, ancient humans wanted psychedelic experiences, but not just anywhere, at the bottom of a deep, dark cave, which has low levels of ox oxygen and can create hallucinations. Let's understand more from Ron Barkai, Professor of Prehistoric Archaeology from Tel Aviv University. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi. It's fine. My pleasure. So what exactly uh, is the connection here to caves? How did you discover that people might have used these deep caves for some kind of psychedelic experience? Well, the caves are well known for a very long time. These are, these are decorated caves mostly from Europe, from Spain and France. And, and the caves are known for a very long time. It is well known that, that, that drawings, depictions, uh, all kinds of, uh, kind of engravings were made uh, deep inside caves, at the bottom of the caves and in, un, and in areas which are inaccessible or very, very difficult to, to, to be reached. And it was, it was never, never suggested why people penetrated so deep down into these dark caves in order to make these, these beautiful depictions. Uh, we came with the, with, the, with the thought after it was discovered that people entered this deep and dark, dark cave with with lamps or even with torches. They needed the, uh, the artificial light in order to light the way and in order to create cave art. So we realized that while they entered the cave with, with torches, uh, they, mu they, they must, have, must have affected the oxygen level inside the caves. And when, and when we simulated that, we realized that while entering the cave with torches, they reduce the level of oxygen uh, well below normal level of, of uh, what is needed to, to humans. And they reach a level of what is known as, as hypoxia, which is a kind of altered state of consciousness. Of, uh, of consciousness. So we realized that by, by using torches, they created a situation inside the cave which, uh, which altered their mind. Really, really fascinating. Dr. Baika, I thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Bye-bye. All right, it's time to take a look at the weather forecast with our Hannah Rifkin. Well, Israel's heat wave is officially broken as temperatures have cooled down a bit and the skies opened up over the weekend. Showers are set to continue in the northern region tonight and tomorrow, with lows this evening expecting to range in the 40s and 50s or between 6 to 13 degrees Celsius. And of course, highs tomorrow in the 60s or the upper teens in Celsius. Now back to the studio. Thank you for that, Hannah. And now, just before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Viewer discretion is advised. That is a wild animal. It is a hyena, I believe, walking in Rishon LeZion, not too far from where our studios are located, with another wild animal inside his mouth. I apologize to all the vegans and vegetarians out there watching right now. It is a little bit disturbing. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.29 shekels to the American dollar and 2.63 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to visit the all new and improved ILTV website at ILTV.tv and subscribe to our newsletter for the latest updates while you're there. I'm Lauren Izo. Thank you for watching.